nervousness and all the things that that something like the coronavirus creates among people around the world. And some cultures have ways of dealing, have rituals or ceremonies that that are able to deal with grief. But in the, sort of the modern capitalist world, we've gotten rid of all those things. And so when something tragic happens, like a pandemic, we are really on our own. I mean, unless you have a religious community or a really solid family, you're just sort of uh, set adrift to try to deal with those feelings. And so we thought it'd be a good idea to, to create a forum where we could talk to people all over the world who are dealing with the rapid changes that are happening in the social sphere not only with the up, with the pandemic, but with the demise of democracy and the rise of this sort of materialist capitalist attitude that leaves out the considerations of the spirit and the soul. And so um, we, we not only listen to people's individual stories of how, of what kinds of things are happening in their lives, but also how they deal with those lack of soul issues in their own part of the world. So that's kind of the impetus of how this came together. So we're very much interested in hearing any talk about the development of the soul and the, the landscape of the interior world. So um, what I'm going to do now is uh, again, share the cover of uh, Lanner's book. Um, this is an introduction uh, to uh, Leonard Kassar's book, uh, Jung's Technique of Active Imagination and De Soy's Directed Waking Dream Method, Bridging the Divide. And uh, we're blessed today to have uh, Dr. Leonard Kassar from Malta, who is going to introduce his book, uh, the book is currently available for pre-order, and it will be um, shipped a week from today, I guess. So, Leonard, go ahead. Um, I would need you to, I could share the, uh, the screen. Is it possible? You, you should be able to at this point, if you just, because uh, I, th I thought I made you a co-host. Okay. If, if you go down to the bottom of the screen and highlight, there you go. Now you're doing it. Okay. You, so again, yep. the, the, so now, welcome everybody. Thank you, um, Skip and Tim for the invitation. Um, it is a pleasure for me to um, share something about the content of this book, which has been um, kind of in the making for quite a few years. And finally, it will be seeing the light of day soon. And also something about um, the process um, of how the book came to be. And um, basically something about how um, historical research as well um, is also something which can um, help one um, in one's own personal life. So I would like to say something about both the content and the course about these two important methods um, which can be used in psychotherapy or, or in analysis. Okay, so um, I will be speaking about these two gentlemen. One is, I think most of you are aware of, Carl Gustav Jung. Um, he was a psychiatrist and also an analyst. And one of his main um, methods of working was by his use of using the imagination. And uh, one of his main methods was active imagination, which I think in your series, you also um, have tackled, if I'm not mistaken, this um, approach. I will be also 
and saying something brief about this. Um, the impetus of active imagination came more um, to the fore in the Jungian world uh, with the publication of Jung's Red Book, which is his own personal um, encounter with his own unconscious, which he wrote down and also he added his own uh, drawings um, to the figures which he met in his unconscious. And of course, one can also find these dialogues with these different figures, which later became the basis of his psychology. So his dialogue with his anima, the dialogue with the shadow, with the devil, and all these concepts then kind of featured and became the basic tenets of Jung's psychology, which was called complex psychology originally, and then it became analytical psychology. Um, of course, the other person is maybe less known, and it was this person was also less known to me over a decade ago. His name is Robert Desual. While Jung was Swiss, as most of you know, Robert Desual was French. Um, both, um, of course, both of them were um, therapists in, in our common use of the word. However, while Jung was a medical doctor, um, Robert Desual was um, an electrical and mechanical engineer. Um, so therapy for him was a passion, um, was a part-time passion. Um, so this is something which, um, again, um, something which is very, very uh, interesting is that they developed um, a method of working with the imagination and therapy around the same time. Jung started uh, developing his method of active imagination from 1912, while Robert Desual uh, started to develop his method of directed waking dream, which in French it is called Rêve Eveillé Dirigé, um, so it is directed waking dream around 1921. However, um, they um, developed the methods independently of each other. Um, the historian Helen Berger, um, Ellen Berger, in his 1970 book, The History of the Unconscious, um, says that this one um, kind of um, took uh, his idea of directed waking dream was a daydream from Jung, which is incorrect um, from my own research. Um, both of them as well um, developed this uh, method of imagination, as I said, independently. It was interesting um, from my research that I discovered that around it, this time there were several European um, persons, individuals, practitioners, and working with people in therapy who also were using um, uh, imaginative methods in psychotherapy. And, and kind of it was interesting because uh, in psychology, um, during after the First World War and the Second World War, um, again, um, a lot of experimentalists have moved to America. So um, during the experimentalists, the psychologists who worked with a lot with uh, sensations and uh, memory, kind of they valued introspection. So they use introspection as a as a good scientific tool. However, after between the word the two world wars, they left. And um, however, uh, again, a few European um, practitioners still uh, made use of the imagination. And as we know, um, the behaviorists, for example, kind of um, considered introspection as not a good method of doing, of researching the behavior of people. Um, so, as well, I would like to say something about 
how these two people again were influenced by um, comic people, including Sigmund Freud. Um, they were influenced by Pierre Janet. I think he was a, a famous French psychiatrist. And I will say something about Pierre Janet um, and how he, uh, he was a very prominent uh, psychiatrist and he put up a resistance um, to the works of Freud to be imported into France. Um, furthermore, the French were very rational. Um, so the Freudians did struggle a lot for uh, psychoanalysis to enter France, let alone for Jungian psychology, since the French and the Germans at the time were at war with each other and kind of they looked suspiciously at the works of um, Carl Gustav Jung. Um, two other important people who influenced both Jung and Desual were um, um, Dante. Both of them were fond of the Divine Comedy. And one important work was of the Swiss, um, um, the famous Theodore Flournois, who wrote the famous text From India to Planet Mars which again kind of um, speaks about these uh, fantasy trips of, of a particular woman um, who was in, um, under trance. So again, studying um, these two individuals, um, one was, I started seeing um, points of connections, um, which um, they were not written before. Um, which for me kind of, um, in a way, they pushed me to continue my research. How did this research kind of came to be? Um, this research started in 2008, 2009. I wanted to do a doctoral study in the UK. And I think as you all know, when you do a doctoral research, you have to find something original. Um, myself, I am very fond of um, art. I'm very fond of using drawings with my uh, patients. Um, as well, kind of, I'm interested in, in, I work also with uh, patients who experience psychotic episodes, and I'm also expressing their art. Um, and again, kind of, I knew Jung. I was um, interested in Jung's uh, technique of active imagination. I knew about it. And I was at a loss that kind of a lot has been written about it. And I was at a loss of finding something original. However, I remembered um, once about a few years before that, I was studying, I was doing a master's in psychology. And um, I was at the end doing the final paper at the end of the course. And um, kind of, I wrote about my love for imagery, my passion for art, and I was doing a Google research. And I remember this one, but at that time, I read something about him, but I didn't have time. I was at the end of the course and I didn't research him. Um, but this name came up to me uh, about five years later when I was trying to kind of find an original topic. And Little did I know that um, this will be um, the start of a long journey of over a decade to searching the life and the work of this one and also finding the correspondence between Jung and this one, which was never uh, written before. So kind of, um, in my opinion, a work chooses you and you don't choose the work. This work itself, um, the book, which I will say how it is divided, for me itself is an active imagination. Since um, kind of I start with the ego position of active imagination of Jung, and I contrast it and compare it with the other, with a lesser known other, which um, again, the other is because of the language problem, while a lot is written in English. In the case of this one, there is only one pamphlet written in English, except uh, until recently, which I will explain later. So again, this was the other 
and the other, as I will explain, because Jungians, um, during Jung's time and just after Jung died, in a way the classic Jungians were not open to um, working and interfering or using the word directing an image in therapy. This was considered a big sin uh, in classical Jungian and to some extent something that it still is. Um, for me, so this was a way of um, dialoguing with something which is different, something which is alien, but the sense of it is to come with something new. Jung speaks about that one, when one dialogues with the unconscious, the third emerges, the transcendent function, something new emerges. And this was, in a way, what part of my work was that I came up with a, a new framework of doing active imagination, not only as the classic Jungians did, but also giving it a framework of how one can practice it uh, while being present with the patient. So the challenge, this was again something which for me was very important. Again, during my research, I visited many archives, I contacted many people, and a lot of synchronistic um, happenings occurred during the search, which were fascinating. Um, so this work took me to over many different countries in Europe, to around 20 archives, different archives, libraries. And um, I met as well a lot of people. I also met uh, analysants of, um, of Robert Desoil, who are still alive today. So again, I, um, I met other people who were the children of these people who experienced them firsthand. So it was a, a fascinating journey of over 10 years, as I said. And um, um, in, in um, speaking and researching um, Robert Desoil and comparing it to the, to the master, which is Jung, um, I also felt that Desoil was not very um, did not have a strong persona like uh, Jung. Jung was a um, was a prominent figure, was a known figure. You know, he traveled. He he um, was invited to many conferences, and he had a strong persona. <laughs> Unfortunately, Desoil tried, but he died in the sixties when um, Jacques Lacan um, took the scene in Paris. Up until the 40s and 50s, this one was quite known. And then because just after the Second World War, but then um, French psychoanalysis um, took over and um, kind of Robert Desoil was, over, was overshadowed. And of course he died. Uh, he did not leave the school except some disciples to form different groups. And they all took his method into different forms. They, some took his method into psychoanalysis, even though Robert Desoil did not um, kind of think, did not want, because he thought that his method is an alternative to psychoanalysis. Some took it to humanistic psychology, some took it to existentialism, some integrated it with, um, with hypnosis. Um, and in my case, I integrated his method with Jungian psychology. Uh, and the aim was, as I said, to offer um, a reinvigoration and uh, a general guideline because the Red Book is fascinating. Um, Jung is fascinating. But when you work with clients for the first time, you really have to struggle for patients to kind of engage with active imagination. And there are also cultural constraints. Um, kind of not every type of people engages with introspection in the same way. Um, anyway, so what I was going to say was that 
um, taking as well an idea from Jung's um, work of active imagination, especially the third part of his book, The Scrutinies, when he says that the dead need you to continue to individual. And I feel that this work also, when I say the work chooses you, that in a way kind of um, you give voice to something which is not complete or something which needs to continue to be developed. And uh, I modestly feel that um, this is my own experience of carrying over this work, of giving um, a memory, um, <clears throat> of giving the memory of these two people a history. Um, so this is something about how the book came to be, which for me was, and still is very important and which still fascinates me today. Um, again, um, uh, I spoke about the, the language barriers. Um, the first, and this one wrote about five books in his life, but the first two works are very important because the first um, two works were influenced by psychoanalysis. Um, he invented um, his method in 1920s, when he was more influenced by Freud and uh, Pierre Janet. Um, and then in the 1940s, he was influenced by um, Carl Jung. So in France, some translations of the work of Jung um, were being translated into French. And this book, um, um, the second book, which is The Waking Dream in Psychotherapy, Essay on the Function and Regulation of the Collective Unconscious, directly references, um, again, the main concept of the collective unconscious and how imagery um, changes when you work with waking dreams with your patient. Um, first kind of personal material starts to come out, but then it joins even um, um, material from, from the myths and, and, and folk tales, uh, which of course Jung speaks about. And then of course, even sometimes um, images kind of, um, they fade into just, um, just light, for example. He speaks uh, a lot about this imagery of just seeing transcendent light. Um, and in this book as well, he mentions the word association test, which is a test used by Jung, um, where um, you give to the patient 100 words and you um, see the different reactions, how the, um, the, the pressure of the person changes where he pauses, also physiologically. And he compares this method um, of the word association test to his method, as, as I will explain. But he doesn't mention active imagination in 1945. So he was not aware of his technique. Okay, so let me start. This is a kind of a quick look at uh, how the book is divided. So in the first part of the book, I will be speaking about um, Jung's active imagination and uh, making reference to it to all the references made by Jung in his collected works, and also on the directed waking dream of Robert de Um In the second part of the, of the book it is dedicated to the historical inv investigation, in which I, as I said, kind of, I, I also focus on the correspondence between these two people. And in the third section, I make a comparison between Red, which is Rev Eveye Dirige, and active imagination. So, um, in a way, kind of um, Rev Eveye Dirige is effectively known as Red. And again, there is a correspondence between Red of Robert Deswal and the Red Book of um, Carl Jung. And uh, through this comparison, which I will be speaking about, then I uh, tease out a new model, which I call imaginative movement therapy, which as I said, 
kind of combines elements of um, the directed waking dream into the classic method of Jung of doing active imagination. So again, this is more in detail in the part one of the book presents a description of the technique of both active imagination and direct waking dream and the focus on post Jungian and post Desmoyan developments of both methodologies. It also describes the different arguments brought forward by Jungians in favor and against the directed waking dream. Part two is a historical investigation of the correspondence and references between Jung and Deswal, as well as between Jung and Deswal's disciples in the 20th century. Part three is devoted to comparing active imagination with the directed waking dream. It starts by exploring the roots of the notion of inferiority in psychology and moves to an analysis of the different spatial metaphors of interiority in Jung's and this one's method. So basically, while Jung uh, favors the depths and uses the metaphor of depths, um, the catabasis, um, the, the census of inferos, um, this one speaks of the depths, but he favors the anabasis, he favors the heights, because he thinks by um, moving in the heights, you overcome the limitations um, of the problems of one's life and you sublimate um, the negative emotions. But he uses a different um, notion of sublimation and which is not only restricted to sublimation of sexual instincts. So this is followed by a critical theoretical comparison between active imagination and directed waking dream which leads to a proposed red-based approach to active imagination, as I have already explained. So this book presents a rapprochement between two psychotherapeutic methods that rely on the use of imagination, C.G. Jung's active imagination technique and Robert Deswald's Reveille Dirige directed waking dream method. Um, to my knowledge, um, yes, with the red book, there has been a lot of interest, again, on active imagination because um, uh, I think before the publication of the Red Book, in the Jungian world, I think um, the emphasis on the oniric, both in Jungian and also in Freudian analysis, was being lost. I think there was a lot of emphasis on a two-person psychology, on transference and counter-transference, and uh, I think with the publication of the Red Book and um, kind of this change. And also to my knowledge in other uh, psychotherapies of today, including um, CBT, including um, um, eye movement, uh, desensitization therapy, EMDR, reproducible therapy, and the use of imagination again is being used. So. Um, again, it is very interesting how um, um, the use of imagination nowadays, again, is emerging. Um, this book, I think there are a lot of very um, fascinating, useful, uh, scholarly books on Jung's active imagination. I think, but this book, I think, is maybe one of the few um, who takes active imagination and out of its um, um, active imagination out of the Jungian circle and kind of uh, kind of I try to to make it dialogue with another approach. So in this way, kind of I think we can um, really appreciate what active imagination is and how it is practiced but also maybe we can also kind of give it a fresh, a fresher look and also make it accessible to um, a wider um, audience, to more psychotherapists of different approaches and methodologies. Because as I said, kind of, yes, uh, um, not everyone is young who could um, face 
um, the perils of his own unconscious. He faced them on his own, even though he had his uh, family, his work, Tony Wolf, in a way, who were present in his life to help him bear uh, kind of uh, what he was, what was emerging. Um, but as I say, from my clinical experience, um, people need guidance. People need um, to learn the basics before they can charter out into, into uh, deeper seas. So, um, and there are a lot of youngs as well who, who did try to use this, but um, um, I think um, what, I, what I am proposing is a, an interesting framework of using visualization modalities um, in, in, in therapy and to have some frameworks how to do these things. This is not that you have to do it um, kind of literally, because I think you lose the soul of, um, of the work. And uh, I think that is important that we don't intrude. But I think to give a starting point um, and to helping hand, then the patient can go and continue engaging with the images which emerge from their unconscious, even on their own. But to arrive at that point, one needs some assistance, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> what is the gist of the book for people who might be interested? This book deconstructs the Jungian notion of free imagination and active imagination, both from historical sources and from clinical perspective. Already there were um, some authors who tried to do this. For example, Wendy Swan in 2007, she tried to deconstruct that um, uh, even though kind of um, uh, young and classic Jungians said that you should not, they should do it, active imagination should be practiced on their own, that you should not interfere. Um, um, I have also found some interesting examples when, when um, they differ from this dogma. And also, I will also give examples of, of how um, facilitating the entry into the unconscious can help uh, clinical work. So I argue that an element of guidance is always present when active imagination is carried out in the therapy itself. And I will be also showing you some quotes from Jung where um, he does not qualify what help and guidance one can give, but he speaks about it. While red is not as directive as it, as it is made out to be. Um, this work also unearths um, a correspondence which have not been talked about by historians, by um, scholars of anarchist psychology between Desual and Jung. And which of course I did not realize when I started the study. So it was fascinating kind of how things, one thing leads you to another and something emerges. It also proposes a framework where the therapist not only witnesses, but actively facilitates the patient to get in touch with unconscious material. So, as I said, a lot of classical analysts speak of the purest approach to images. In uh, Mysterium Conjunctionis of 1950, Jung underlined the importance of keeping the image as it is and not to contaminate it with one's own ideas. Above all, don't let anything from outside that does not belong get into it, for the fantasy image has everything it needs. So I think Jung is very uh, clear about uh, not interfering in any way with the image. <clears throat> However, in these two quotes, I, there are other quotes which you can find in the book, but I chose two. In the first paper, which uh, he writes about the method of active imagination in 1916, which was then republished in 1960 with a prefatory note to it, Jung observed, we find cases where there is no tangible mood or depression at all, but just a general dull discontent, a feeling of resistance to everything, a sort of boredom or vague disgust, an indefinable but excruciating emptiness. In these cases, no definite starting point exists. How can we tap into the unconscious? Many times there are no dreams being presented. 
so which would first have to be created. So again, he speaks of a starting point, but he does not say how. And from my experience, yes, you say, someone tells you I'm feeling really depressed, kind of um, what image comes to mind? And a lot of people kind of block. You know? So, um, or as they might say, black or they find it very difficult to kind of allow themselves and let go enough to enter the imaginal realm. Again, in yoga and West, Jung stated that the method of active imagination consists in a special training for switching off consciousness, at least to a relative extent, thus giving the unconscious contents a chance to develop. So again, he speaks of a special training. But and he does not mention what the special training is. In the Red Book as well, he speaks about breathing, but he doesn't say, and yoga, but he doesn't say um, kind of what these exercises were. So he does mention them, but he does not explain. And Marie-Louise von Franz, who was a faithful disciple, a lawyer, and she does not thing that preparing the body for um, allowing patients to access the imaginary realm was important. For her, um, going into nature was enough to um, kind of to be in the body. Um, and she did not kind of make, she could not understand the importance of the new approaches of body psychotherapy. So again, these were, these were the classical animals. Um, so again, the tension, Jung speaks about the tension of the opposites, and this work speaks about these two tensions of um, undirected works to access the imagination or some use of direction, but direction with a small D, not with a big D, because um, it has also political connotations, and the direction used in the uh, directed waking dream is a soft um, suggestion. It is not um, a controlling um, way. And anything that is given to the patient is egosyntonic, as I will speak later and I will explain what egosyntonic means. <clears throat> so the work speaks about these two tensions. Um, as regards the historical research, um, I found one key person who uh, was um, important to, and also kind of, uh, he was friends with both. Deswal and uh, Jung never met in person, and, uh, and they corresponded briefly with each other, as you read in the book. But um, there was one person, he was from Switzerland, who wrote in the 1960s a first biography about uh, Jung, which is uh, the psychoanalyst Charles Badois, who also developed a psychoanalytic method. So like we have the Bionian psychoanalysis, the um, Kleinian analysis, that is also um, in Switzerland is quite popular. Is, there is the Institute of Psychotherapy and Psychology of Charles Badois. It's still in existence today. Um, and, and again, he was a friend of um, he was a friend of uh, of Jung, and uh, again, his secretary was uh, Richard Vervan. He worked a lot in Switzerland and also in North of Italy. Um, he was analyzed by this one, and it was Charles Badois who, in the 1930s, he had a review of his institute called Action Upon Sir, Action and Thinking where they write in the same journal in the same day. And the Jung was invited to write, and in the same edition, you find both this one and both, and find the name of Jung. Um, so again, Switzerland, especially the French-speaking Switzerland, and the Jungians and the Swalians collaborated, especially after the two masters died. Um, although maybe the classic analyst kind of as I said in the beginning, they look down on any form of integration, any form of directivity. 
um, again, some disciples of uh, some prominent French Jungians like Pierre Soli, Ali Umba, um, they collaborated considerably with some disciples of, the, of Robert de Soir. So in a way, kind of, again, historically kind of, I found that there were um, these uh, connections, there were these bridges um, in a context which I have explained made it very difficult for these two approaches to meet, both because of the two world, war, world wars um, and their implications, political implications, and the French were not um, so much keen of welcoming a German invasion. And um, again, there was a language barrier. And um, Jung himself, um, I read a recent uh, article of about a year ago when this work was already complete um, of uh, Florence Serena, who is a Jungian scholar, a French Jungian scholar, where he speaks about the two visits of Jung in Paris. And the daughter of Jung, Gret Bauman, was living in Paris, and both his wife, Emma, and Jung um, did travel to Paris several times. Emma was also invited to speak at the uh, Lucra, Lugro uh, for you, which is the French Jungian club, uh, about the anima. Uh, and, and, um, but I think, don't think this one, like from my research, I didn't. Uh, Find that this one attended the, the meeting. And ironically, ironically, Jung says later on in his life that um, he gave up on the French because they did not uh, welcome him. And interestingly enough, he did not mention that much earlier, this one really, really, really was admiring Jung's work and wanted so much to collaborate with him. So it's interesting why Jung does this, because already there was one important French person um, who wanted to collaborate with, with Jung, but Jung later says, I give up on the French because you know, they don't know, understand or my concepts, or um, they are too Cartesian, they are too rational. This is what Jung says. Um, <clears throat> So this is um, a copy of the 1940, uh, the 1938 uh, book, the first book, uh, which this world sends to Jung. And this book is found in, I found it in Jung's library, home library. I think to Jung's grandson, Andre, Andre Jung, Andreas Jung, he welcomed me in his home in his library. And, um, I looked at his book, and you can find the dedication of this world to Jung, homage, homage to the author, to the, from the author to Dr. Jung, as a testimony of, his, of my profound admiration. Um, <clears throat> so again, this book continues, the historical part continues to kind of map, to create affiliation map between uh, people who kind of uh, that both Jung and this work collaborated uh, with each other, like Mircea Eliad uh, collaborated, knew of this one's work and he collaborated closely with, with Carl Jung. Um, then there, is, uh, there are many others like um, Roberto Saggioli of Psychosynthesis, uh, which again, in the early, he worked, he was at the Bulgosli when Jung was at uh, just soon after uh, Jung left from the Bulgosli uh, Psychiatric Hospital in Zurich. Um, and this one um, in the 19, late 1950s uh, and 1960s, he um, in a way kind of um, welcomed psychosynthesis and the waking dream, uh, you can still find it integrated in psychosynthesis today. And he also participated in some conferences of psychosynthesis. For example, in Paris, um, the, the first president of the Psychosynthesis Institute uh, was Jean Guillot, who was a main uh, collaborator and disciple of Robert Desoir. 
who would invite uh, Asad Jewelry, who would invite the psychologist Paul Deere, and uh, they would all be together and, and uh, discuss the new ideas of psychosynthesis. And through this channel, kind of the waking dream of Robert Desmore became known as well. So kind of, I, I also kind of find all these connections between these two people. And I also managed to trace those practitioners who had studied with this one and trained in the Red Method before they trained as Jungians. Um, so some, for example, French um, analysts, prominent analysts, Jungian analysts, had done analysis and are trained in the direct waking dream method. Although, as I said, they, from my research, they don't mention it because there is still this idea that, you know, we should do, we should practice the classical approach. As well as identify the French Jungians who collaborated with the Swalians in the 1960s. As I mentioned, the prominent Jungians like uh, Pierre Soli, uh, Gilbert Gris, um, and Elie Humbert. So such findings help to bring out an inclusive spirit of some French Jungians. I also explore an important theme of why Jung did not acknowledge European practitioners of imaginative methods, which I spoke about in my introduction, when I said that around the time that both Jung and Deswald developed um, these, their methods of using um, diurnal dreams, waking dreams, and not only uh, nocturnal dreams, um, and working with this um, diurnal oniric way, there were others. Uh, however, um, I did not find any reference to these people in the collected works. Um, it is interesting that in the 1930s, Jung gave seminar at the ETH University in Zurich. And he compares active imagination to older methods of using the imagination. And he compares it with the famous exercises of uh, Saint Ignatius of Loyola. And uh, he also compares it to uh, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which I think you will be doing something from, from kind of the program which uh, Skip has kindly sent out. Um, and there were others like Karl Hapte, Goyeril, and uh, the last one, Hans Karl Leuner, is still popular, much more popular than Robert Deswald, although the work of Robert Deswald precedes that of the German Hans Karl Leuner, which is called as symbol drama. Um, and ironically, Hans Karl Leuner was um, analyzed by Gustav Schmalz, which was a Jungian analyst. Um, and uh, uh, probably Hans Karl Leuner was also um, a disciple of Karl Hapier. So a uh, simple drama or guided affective imagery, this psychotherapy is known today, builds on similar to uh, the French method of waking, direct waking dream. Um, and um, Leuner was also in correspondence with uh, Jung about this, and uh, he also gave a talk at the Zurich, um, at the Zurich Club. And um, Yolanda Jacob kind of wrote a good review. So it's interesting that there were these connections and these masters, but Jung focuses on, instead of uh, taking a, a, a vertical approach, um, a horizontal approach, he takes a vertical, he goes down, he goes down and um, he chooses uh, the wider, he compares it with the, also the Orient uh, and the um, imaginative techniques from the Orient. And he takes it even, as I said, with, with um, uh, compares it with uh, the spiritual exercises of the Ignatius of Loyola and, um, and alchemy, which uh, in a way uh, is also kind of it features into um, the esotericism of the 17th century. Um, so, we, Leonard, 
it's interesting to kind of that I don't know if he suffered from some from some anxiety of influence. Kind of he stuck to his method on he knew about this, but they are not referenced. So this was again maybe kind of you know, in a way kind of I, I looked at, again at all these people and kind of tried to continue the dialogue between the uh, young method of active imagination and their methods. What was there was a question was there a question from the audience here? Uh, yeah, Leonard, I wanted to ask if you could describe the direct method. I am I'm coming okay. to it in a, in a two minutes. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, go ahead. So um, this work also managed to bring together. I also realized that after the swell died, that usually happens, you know, um, when when the pater familias dies, you know, many times there is fighting about the inheritance, you know, and the same uh, fate happened as also happened to Jung, you know, we have uh, splits and splits and different institutes. In London, I think there are five. In Zurich, there are two or three. Um, in America, I don't know how many. So kind of the nature of the psyche is to split. So the same thing was with this one. And and uh, after he died, um, uh, again, they, they started a group called uh, the International Group of uh, Directed Waking Dream of this one. But um, uh, first they removed the word directed because it was in the 1960s, the time of the hippies, the time of um, uh, kind of, you know, uh, authority is, uh, doesn't come from outside, but sense of autonomy was important. So they said this has to go. And then just uh, and then they split again and they said um, it should become the international group of uh, waking dream in psychoanalysis and they also uh, eliminated um, um, the name of this one. Uh, however, some loyal dis disciples continue to practice his method in a similar way. Um, this was also in Paris and also I found it in Argentina and in Uruguay, um, where I made contact with uh, some people who still practice the method. Um, some took somatic, some took it into the body. So they were uh, different. And uh, I contacted all these people. And uh, in 2014, I, after 50 years, um, and different people from all different schools came to Malta and uh, uh, were invited by the Jungians, by my group. And we had, a, again, they met together again. And, and uh, you know, we allowed, they allowed themselves and also our, to, to dialogue together, which was a very moving and so forth experience. But yes, we all have differences. We all kind of have different slants, but ultimately, and there is also a common heritage which, you know, we cannot um, afford, you know, already there are about 3,000 unions in the world, which are very few, and there are about maybe 200, 300 uh, practitioners of the waking dream. So if we want kind of to continue this heritage, you know, we have to make it an effort of collaboration. And again, I founded uh, um, an international network for the study of waking dream, then we came, we came came together again in Milan in 17, another Congress. We were supposed to meet in Paris, but COVID came and, and unfortunately we had to stop. So we hope that this um, spirit of inclusion, of collaboration, of safeguarding the heritage, European heritage of mental imagery continues. Um, okay, so Again, I will now be coming to, to the questions of explaining a little bit more about the methods so that you can have a sense. In my work, I compare the approaches um, on, on these um, points, uh, kind of what is the same and what is different in terms of the setting and preparing of the body before one can engage with the imagination, what kind of structure and direction can be given by the analyst or therapist, the use of transference and counter-transference, 
um, the notion of a narrative. Um, in the Red Book, which I think most of you know about, there is a um, dialogues between Jung and figures from the unconscious. And in what way this is a different narrative than the narratives we find in the waking dream. And also have a look at um, interpretation. Um, interpretation in the Latin sense of putting it in, the, in between and kind of witnessing rather than kind of putting um, a meaning for what the client presents to us, which I think it is also common for both approaches. So when I come, when I kind of made this comparison, I teased out which elements from the directed waking dream of this one can um, be uh, in a way uh, integrated um, into into the. Um, classic method of active imagination, but used in therapy, in analysis, without uh, safeguarding the principles and the tenets of Jungian psychology. And as a result, I then come up with a hybridized integration framework for the practice of the directed waking dream in analytical psychology, which I call IMT, Imaginative Movement Therapy, which I will explain. So, um, I think I already spoke about this. Um, active imagination is, Jung defines it as a dreaming with our eyes open, although we can also close them as most of you know, where we allow unconscious material to emerge spontaneously. And of course we um, uh, dialogue with, with, these, uh, with this uncon unconscious material and we don't kind of surrender completely. We don't. It's important that we don't lose our sense of ego because um, um, if we are not strong enough, we can also develop a, psycho, a psychosis, no? And if some patients you know, have a weak ego, I think this can, can, can also be um, dangerous to use it. Um, <clears throat> so in active imagination, there is an active weakening of normal daytime consciousness. Pierre Jung uses the idea of Pierre Janet, Abassement de Nouveau Mental, where kind of you, uh, you are in a quiet setting, maybe a little bit, not a lot of light, when you kind of you are silent with yourself and see what images, when you think of a problem that you have, could be depression, could be an obsession that you have, could be a part of a dream, and you see what comes up. Okay? Um, Jung, as I said, kind of in a classic way, as I had said earlier, believe that in order to do this work, you need to uh, first go to uh, a, a course of therapy to strengthen your ego, and then you engage in it. And um, he also emphasized the need of doing it on your own. And also in the Red Book, this is very emphasized, the way of the alone. Um, because um, he, in a way, underlined that there is a risk when you do it with someone else because uh, you put someone else as your master uh, when you should really listen to yourself. Um, <clears throat> however, he also believed that when you do it alone, patients have less transference complications and the patient is not subjected to the therapist's influence. So these are the classic steps, you let the unconscious come up. When you think of a, a problem, when you think of a, a figure, which is a disturbing figure from your dreams, uh, it can be an obsession, it can be a pattern of behavior that you engage in. And as Mari Stein likes to say, that what comes, come and if it moves, follow. And then the second point, which is very important, you come to terms with the unconscious. It is not just kind of, uh, in a way, kind of to allow just the unconscious, but you really need to wrestle with it. And once you wrestle with the angel, as we, um, I think there was one speaker recently, which you can go and fight to, uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel in the Bible, um, uh, kind of you have then to apply it into life. So he speaks of an ethical confrontation. So it's useless just engaging with the images unless you try to 
apply something of that insight into your life. The faithful disciple, Maria Louise Montan, speaks of emptying the mind of the ego. So he speaks of the mind, he doesn't speak of preparing the body. Let an unconscious sense of the image arise, give it some form of expression, be it using just visualization, it could be using a journal like Krogov's journal or Champion's journal. It could be uh, doing it in the sand when you have sand play. It could be movement uh, therapy. Uh, it is also interesting that there was one analyst, one, one patient, famous patient, who became a therapist. Her name was, she was from Switzerland. Her name was Tina Keller. Um, she went to analysis to Jung, but she, 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 he, she says he couldn't engage with her unconscious figures. So she chose Antonia Wood. And, um, and uh, uh, she also um, mentions this while in her works because she had done, also done some analysis with the Swiss person which I spoke about, Charles Batouin. So, and, and she used movement. She used movement as an expression but she happened to know as well both uh, methods and she speaks of the directed waking dreams in her letters and her correspondence, which I found in the archives in the medical uh, library in London. And then the last stage is the ethical confrontation. Um, Jung Singer speaks about it's not important what method you use, uh, what, 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 me, what medium you use. Um, what is most important is the relationship between the ego and the unconscious. Okay? Uh, and as I said, there are different modalities. You can dance, paint, play with sand, etc. And again, ironically enough, Jung is uh, hardly mentioned. A lot of um, humanistic uh, therapies like um, art, art therapy, music therapy um, have uh, owed a lot to Jung. No? But I think some uh, people uh, kind of uh, hardly speak about uh, this therapy that Jung gave us. Um, as I said, so um, um, these are all types of active imagination. Dora Kalk invented Zen play. White House invented movement, authentic movement therapy, where you move. Then there is the use of art, a drawing. You can draw an image. You can draw a dream and look at the dream, witness the dream, engage with the dream. We have play therapy, Allen and Green, from a Jungian perspective, journal, writing, or therapy, Ira Provo, champion. There's voice therapy, um, Wolfson, 19, Diane Austin, Newman, Paul Newman. And then there's the visualization modality, which um, I, I introduced in, 19, in 2014, which I call imaginative movement therapy. So, the question, procedures of red or reverbia de jeu or directed waking dream. So, um, this one uh, speaks a lot of detail about how to practice the method. And uh, while in Jungian um, analysis, we don't use, we rarely use the couch. And if we use the couch, like unlike the Freudians, we don't sit behind the couch but we um, uh, sit and we see the patient because that's important, no? Or else we just use armchairs or chairs. So in Reveille, in the classic Deswalian method, the patient would lie down and uh, <clears throat> with the help of a guide or therapist, he or she is given an initial image as a stimulus to focus on. So Robert Deswal would give an image uh, in the form of a stimuli, and he would invite or the patient to continue this image. So I will give you an example. He had um, some classic stimuli which he used, but then he was very creative. So uh, imagine that you are walking down an, an alley. And can you kind of continue this uh, imagination. So in the Deswalian method, the stimuli is very short, 
the direction is very short. As I mentioned in psychosynthesis before, for example, or in, in gestalt therapy, I also, uh, I'm a gestalt therapy, training gestalt therapy, and there are many exercises. For example, there's a famous book by Stevens where you have these whole exercises. Imagine that you're on a mountain and then on a mountain you meet an old man. The old man takes you somewhere and then he gives you something. What is this something? So that's a whole already kind of formulated story. In the red method, the stimulus is very short, brief. And uh, um, um, he would give it and he would uh, invite the patient to speak about what he is imagining. So um, the, the therapist is receiving, is listening to the imaginative story, which I call a crustic nar narrative and a crisis from the Greek, which used to uh, speak to an audience about uh, a tragedy or a play that they had seen, the art of conveying something that you have seen. Um, so this is uh, then spoken out loud, and the therapist, in the same case of this one, he would encourage you, and he would encourage you to immerse yourself, again, similar to the Ignatian exercises. Tell me what you see, tell me what you listen, to tell me what you hear, tell me what you feel, what do you want to do, and it's in the present. So this is a little bit different than the Jungian, where we, classical Jungian, when we dialogue with a figure. Of course, if a figure emerges, you can still dialogue with it. That's why we dialogue with our patient to ask her something. Um, so there's an emphasis on a sensorial immersion in the imagination. And he would also invite the patient to explore the vertical axis. So he would invite the patient to enter a cave, to jump into the sea, and again, with a, to allow the imagination to go, to, to, to kind of ex explain what they are seeing in the sea, what fish, what figures, what, whatever emerges. And also kind of in a very fantastical way to go in the sky and see. And also he would ask them about their emotion. And that is very important because the emotion will change. Many times in the death, there is a lot of fear of angst, anxiety. When you meet a big fish, a monster in the cave, a dragon, while in the heights, many times you meet celestial figures. And there, there is a different emotion. The therapist will also write the narrative and at the end of the session, which can be, in, this one would not do it very frequently, once every two weeks or once every three weeks. The session would be long at the time, about one and a half or two hours, and this would take on for quite some. He would write the narrative and he would ask the patient to go home and also write the nar narrative to, uh, see what associations they would come to, to their mind. And also they might draw and also to be aware of the dreams in the night dreams and nocturnal dreams. And then the next time they meet, again, they will ask how they are and they will look at the narrative, see which aspects they left out. Again, they might have censored, uh, praised, um, and also see what are the associations. Um, so again, what is interesting is when you do it um, in the presence of the uh, therapist or the analyst, um, kind of, so you, the therapist is holding the patient. You are there for the patient and the voice is the bridge. It's the holding hand in a metaphorical way so that the patient can feel more secure and go on exploring this um, imaginative uh, experiences that they kind of uh, make up. Um, in the beginning, I am drifting a little bit down from this one, some patients kind of, you know, kind of they, kind of they might, the ego is still a lot in control. So, but with time kind of again, like when we have in the young inactive imagination, kind of they can hold themselves 
kind of the, by not allowing things to change so much or to put in what they want, but to allow things to emerge. And since they are speaking to you, you know when they are doing this because they might pause and you might see a different reaction if they, if they meet something and they don't say it because they are moving while they're lying on the couch. So then you can ask them about these things later. So let's go on the types of initial stimuli, but as I said, um, um, stimuli in the case of Jaswal and also later about his disciples, um, he would take, for example, and repeat the, the word that the patient uses. So we speak of ego syntonic stimuli nowadays, coming from not that I give you, but that they come from you, a part of a dream that you continue, which is very, very similar to what Fritz Perls, who also the founder of Gestalt Therapy knew about this one's work and he took this idea of continuing the dream. Um, so so uh, these are the initial stimuli, for example, these are the old ones when he was still very much influenced by Freud and the theme of a sword for a man and the vast for a woman, its purpose being to understand one's sexuality. So kind of he would say to a person, imagine that there is a sword in a room, kind of continue, imagine what will happen. And this, the patient will tell you, I don't know that the, I, you know, that the, you will go, what kind of sword is it? Where is the sword? What do you do with the sword? Who do you meet? How do you feel? And the story emerges. The, the theme of descent to the bottom of the sea, his purpose being to confront one's shadow theme of a witch or a, source, or a sorcerer, its purpose being to come to terms with the parent of the opposite sex, the parent of one's own sex. The theme of descending in a cave to find a dragon, its purpose being to come to terms with authority. The theme of sleeping beauty or prince charming, its purpose being to come to terms with the ethical situation. So these are classical um, initial stimuli, but as I said, nowadays, these are really given and uh, kind of one um, listens to particular metaphors that the patient tells you or images from a dream which you invite the patient to continue with. So um, there is less directivity in this sense. And as I said, through the method of ascending in imaginative space, a person comes into contact with his or her higher potentialities and spiritual tendencies, while descending brings him or her into contact with her instincts and primitive tribes. So, as I said, um, the Swal encouraged patients to face the things which provoked anxiety in waking dreams, such as dragons, octopus. At times, he also asked the patient to imagine the therapist beside him. And because he encouraged patients as well to fantasize, to allow their imagination to, to be free when they imagine, um, he would also offer patients protective objects, like, for example, a magic wound in front of a dragon, something which uh, von Franz and, of course, Jung and many classic, of course, they disagreed with. And, of course, this is not in line with Jungian thinking, because in the Red Book, you know, Jung struggled a lot. It is, Jung speaks of the way of the crucifixion. We have to be crucified and, and bear the tension until something comes out. And I don't, with a, a swirl of the magic wound, everything will go. Um, but I'm explaining the original method of this one. <clears throat> um, and although, of course, recently as well, there are many grounding techniques which are more um, ego syntonic. You don't ask them to imagine you, but you can imagine someone to feel their legs while they are, um, to look around them if they see something which might help them. So these are more ego syntonic. Um, kind of, so you can give them something to support themselves without interfering. In another phase of the therapeutic work, the subject writes a report of his waking dream, which will then be used in a face-to-face -face session in order to explore the meaning of the scenario. So, as I said, there were various groups after the small died, and they all gave it a different twist. 
Um, some remove to the moving up and down, but allow the patient to go where they want. And uh, they gave a lot of importance to transference and counter transfer. So even when the patient is telling you, is telling you the waking dream, you need to be aware of what's going on inside of you, what sensations you have, what images you have, what thoughts come to your mind. And you can also give them an image from your counter transference. So this is different when I choose already um, an image for you. Um, <clears throat> so as I said, I tried to kind of find something which can be used and enrich the active imagination when it's used relationally and not on, on one's own. And also to start using it, not in the first session or in the second session, but it doesn't have to wait until the end of analysis. It can be part of analysis. Um, because um, again, there is support being offered. And if you offer some support, then uh, you strengthen the ego. And the ego is strengthened and can then face better the unconscious. Um, so in my method, I, which I, can, I give a lot of importance to relaxation. Um, this one also speaks of autogenic training, one of his later works. Relaxation can be just breathing exercises, um, relax in a quiet room. And I also speak of an anergic stimulus, which is egocentric, but a stimulus which is kind of uh, homes in, zones in on the issue which the patient needs to kind of tackle, which they are reluctant and resistant to face. So I use the Greek word of the energia, something which energizes and kind of opens up something. Um, um, and again, we can take a lot um, from what the patient presents or else uh, from Jungian literature, from fairy tales, from myths, uh, you can also have ideas of what to introduce. And again, very briefly, you don't say a whole story, it's a brief and then you allow them to kind of um, use their imagination. I also like the uh, kind of term ekrastic narrative again, the notion of ekrasis, where kind of you, the patient communicates to you what you have experienced. And uh, this is an important aspect, which in a way combines uh, the voice with the image, uh, the word with uh, the visual, the vocal, um, so you have a, uh, an imaginative performance and an oral performance. And in a way, this is a kind of reprocessing. Like we, it's also very useful for trauma work when we speak of bilateral stimulation, reprocessing, where uh, kind of you're using different channels at the same time. It helps to shift the trauma, for example. Um, um, and I will give you a very, um, for example, I had one patient in analysis in his 20s, a uh, very socially anxious person, suffered from anxiety. And um, I kind of, we spoke a lot about anxiety. And at one point, I asked the patient, kind of, in the classical way of active imagination, kind of, can you rest a bit, close your eyes, and see what comes up? If you just focus on your fear and nothing comes up. And I asked him, can you imagine, can you compare the fear to an animal? That's what came to me in that moment. And he said, hmm, a big animal, a big animal. Okay, something tall, so the bird I'm seeing. Okay, a bird with tall legs. And he was a very big man, very, and inside of him was very small, very inferior, very low self-esteem, almost like an agoraphobic, almost a home playing to video game, with no work and a lot of social anxiety, except online. And uh, kind of, I could make a choice. I could either ask him to draw and to have a dialogue with uh, this bird and see what comes up, or I, I could use this method of unfolding the image moving the image forward. And I used the latter, since I was uh, using my method. And uh, he said, um, and he said, I asked him, what is this bird? And he said, it's an emu. 
a very big bird. And he said, this emu is, uh, and I said, where is this emu? And he said, this emu is in, a, in an open field. And they said, this emu is, you know, lowering his head and uh, because he's afraid that something will come, it's coming to him from above to attack him. And he, he starts to run. The emu starts to run. He's seeing the emu running and, and he's saying, I'm afraid, I'm seeing this emu running. And, uh, and, um, and this continues. And, and um, I asked him when he ended this uh, short waking dream, I asked him to choose a title and he says, it is the emu who lost his friends. So this emu, because of his fear of attack from above, um, and he said that's again a very uh, predator, predatory um, bird from above who was attacking him, this emu. So there was a lot of fear. And I asked him for a title and he said, and he said, oh, spontaneously like, uh, he said like my story, he said, I lost all my friends. And he started to relate um, an experience of abuse when he was a 10 year old by when he was in the locker at school. Uh, when he was in the changing room, opening his locker. So in a way, this came up, this old trauma came up. And uh, again, we could speak then about this. And even when he was relating the dream, kind of, um, he was ducking his head, lowering his head, while this man was almost double my size, you know. He was not aware of his energy. So in a way, this is, Again, an example of how one can work with this. And then again, I asked him to write this and, and, and to, to continue to speak about it. So this is one example. Yeah, um, he, Le Leonard, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm ignorant. So I need, uh, I need for you to def define the wor word ekphrastic again. Ekphrasis is, is, a, is, a is a Greek term which means um, in in um, the famous orators, because there was no, the famous orators would um, describe to a group of people something that they have witnessed, be it a painting, be it a, a play, a tragedy, and that they have witnessed, and they would communicate it to an audience, and they would recreate this, when they speak about it, they would recreate to the audience the same experience that they have felt when they witnessed it. That is ekphrasis in, okay. in Greek. And then of course I combined this theme with, wake, with the way waking dream, the directed waking dream of this one, which I then coined in emergent movement therapy, is the same way when the, when the patient is seeing in his mind a drama and the patient is trying to communicate it to me. It's not the same thing, but the idea of something which someone sees and then communicates it to someone who is not seeing it, but trying to, um, trying to have a sense of what the person is uh, experiencing when they speak about it. Is this clear to you? Hello? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, so that's uh, at least I'm in the ballpark in terms of understanding. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Gibb? Yes. I have a couple of questions about Robert Deswa. Uh, my first question is uh, to what extent was the fact that he uh, joined the French Communist Party uh, have an effect upon his career? Okay. I'm very pleased to hear that someone knows about this. Um, yes, um, uh, Mercia Aliabe, um, um, in one of his journals, speaks about um, speaks about this, and um, because he met he met him after the after the Second World War. Um, 
as I said in the beginning, I don't know if I said it, uh, this one was, came from a Catholic family. Um, came from a Catholic family. And uh, in the 1920s, there was, um, after the First World War, there's a lot of poverty. And, um, and again, kind of, um, his brother um, was named Henri. He was a medical doctor. And his brother was very much involved in unions, trade unions. And he fought a lot for the rights of the workers. Um, so, um, basically, uh, this one taught, um, this one taught, of course, believes that, um, he believed that his method um, would help because he was very much disillusioned with, um, with the two world wars where he um, was a soldier. He was a, I think he was in Seri in France. I, I write about this in my book as well. So he was very much disillusioned by what he saw. So in a way kind of he um, thought that his method um, would link someone to something which was less cruel, less ugly. He emphasized the transcendent, um, but not the transcendent in a, in a Catholic way, because then he saw that um, kind of the big religions were not helping people, there was still war. And then he, uh, there was this new movement of communism, which again, um, of course he was um, not right because he was not aware of the atrocities in his correspondence with the Swiss educator Adolf Perrier, of what was going on in Russia. But he believed in this idea of um, uh, communism giving um, help, giving support, giving a hand to, to the poor in the sense of equality. So again, he, um, I think this was a mistake. Um, uh, he didn't know the effect of this. And um, however, his method, which is a, is also a way of bringing one to oneself and kind of um, find some source of support, some source of um, soul in a world which was very dark. Um, so the authors of between, uh, between the wars many times tackle about, speak about these issues of disillusionment with, with, uh, with the cruelty and the atrocities of the wars. Um, so, yes, he joined, uh, um, he joined the communist, communists in the time. His brother, Henri, um, as well, this was the time of the, when France was, at, was also um, coming out from uh, the, the Vichy regime period, the Vichy period, when France was attacked by the Nazis. Um, his brother was also taken in the concentration camp in Mount Hausen. I found as well um, this, this uh, information in the archives. He was also given a medal of, the, of, um, of his work during the war. This well as well was, was uh, um, his father was, a gener was an important general in the First World War. And he took part in both. As I said, um, Jung, for example, again, was a um, criticized for his support, which people interpreted of the Nazi regime, because he thought that um, something new is emerging. And again, he was wrong. Um, uh, and the same thing in the case of the Swan, there's also a similarity. He thought communism would give a sense of equality, a sense of hope in a, in, in a time which was very bleak. And his, met, his method also has to be seen in, in, in this way. Um, again, even Fritz Perls, the founder of Gestalt Therapy, was a, a doctor in, in, in France during the, during, the, during the, he saw a lot of trauma, hence his uh, work on the body of uh, unfreezing the frozen traumatic body. So these um, methods have also to be seen in the context of their times. Is the, is the war one of the reasons why Desois uh, embraced Pavlovian thought? Sorry? 
was uh, the impact of the wars upon uh, Desoile a reason that he embraced the work of Pavlov? I am not hearing the question clearly. Can you repeat, please? Sorry about this. It is my understanding that at some point in his life, Desoile became interested in the work of Pavlov. Yes, that and is I'm towards the... Was the cause of that the war or some other reason? I think it's, I, as I said, I don't know if I did say this. Um, this was, I think, mistake was that he shifted. He had a very important method, which he found himself, but somehow he had to connect it with another theory. And the first years from 1920 to 1940s, his first wife, who was a poet, Lucy, who dedicates the first book to her, she also wrote a short book of poetry. Um, she was also a, a Catholic and involved in um, involved in Catholic circles. Um, kind of, um, he was very much influenced, and he kind of used psychoanalytic um, theories to explain how this happens, how the change uh, of using the waking dream, how change is affected in his method. Then in the 40s, he leans on Jung because he finds resonance and he feels that the Jungian theory kind of explains very well what happens. The dominant theory in the 60s and the, was behaviorism and um, uh, this one never wanted um, his method to be associated with psychoanalysis. Um, in fact, he, he said that uh, even Bachelard, the famous um, poet, Gaston Bachelard dedicates one of his chapters, chapter six in the book Air and Dreams to the, to the work of, um, to the work of Desoil, because while psychoanalysis is interested in the past, the work of Desoil um, is, um, is a move towards the future. It, he calls of a mise en marche, um, helps the person to move forward. And uh, he also had patients, as well had patients um, who were um, um, analyzed by psychoanalysts of the times, at the times, and uh, they remained stuck. And uh, his method helped them move forward. So um, he took, he still kept some of the principles, um, but he believed that his method um, was a, an alternative to psychoanalysis. Um, Pavlov was popular in, again, um, the influence from Russia, it was also very um, dominant behaviorism, the behavioristic school. Um, so this was also probably um, also one main influence. And as I say, it was the dominant um, theory in psychology at the time. Um, so this is what I can say, but his, um, his later works, because in 1955, he writes a book where he kind of um, contrasts his work to psychoanalysis. And after 1955, the works, he um, um, calls his method the rational method. So he definitely then sidelines with, with, uh, with uh, behavioristic principles. He was, uh, he himself uh, was a very, from the correspondence with Ad which um, it's very interesting with uh, Adolphe Ferrier, he was very much interested he was in mathematics. As I said, he wanted to study physiological psychology. What I forgot to, to say is, which is interesting with the development of art, which we um, kind of, when we speak of the Red Book, we know about um, the movement of art in the Jung, in, in Jung's time. Um, and surrealism was also um, dominant in the time of, of um, the 1920s and 30s. However, uh, I found an interesting um, correspondence with uh, 
um, one scientist, his name is Charles Henri, which he speaks about the theory of colors. And um, uh, at the time, artists in France, like the Pointalists or the Divisionists, who are similar to the Impressionists, but they used to make points of color. And um, the different colors used would leave a different emotion in the person. And also the direction. So if the brush stroke or the points are directing towards looking down, they would leave, leave um, an emotion of negativity, a low mood. While if the strokes or the dots have a, have a the figure which is being drawn, have a, it looks towards in a vertical way, it kind of elevates the spirit of the person. So this is an interesting um, finding from my research, which I find that um, um, this world was influenced by the work of Charles Henri, who also then influenced Charles Henri, influenced these artists. So, um, yes, but going to your question, kind of, um, probably it, it is through the influence of uh, communism, uh, the Russian behaviorist who kind of, and also his need to um, keep on um, giving a solid theoretical, he was a practitioner. As I said, he was not, he was a practitioner. He developed his method from, again, he was influenced like Jung. He read the book of Theodore Flournoy from India with Planet um, Mars. And it is from his wife, Lucy, who had met the astrologist. He was also uh, called Eugene Caslan. He was also an occultist um, who wrote a book the method of the development of supranormal faculties, where he, where she experienced this, his wife experienced this method, and she spoke about this method to Robert Desmond, and he was fascinated by it. But he applied, he turned this method, which was used for um, esoteric purposes, into a psychotherapeutic method. But he did it in a very scientific way. So even though Jung and Deswal were interested, were still interested, were still open there, but they were rigorous scientists. So um, even though, as I said, um, he called the towards the end of his life his method as uh, the rational method of psychotherapy. Um, anyway, so this is maybe. Uh -huh. Do you happen to know if uh, Robert Deswan is mentioned in any of the correspondence or works of uh, Dr. Freud, Jung, or Pierre Genet? No, no, no. He's never mentioned. Um, he's, um, uh, he mentioned another French psychiatrist, but he was influenced. He is not, he is mentioned by, as I said, by the French poet of the imagination, the famous uh, Gaston Bachelard. Uh, he was a friend also of the philosopher Gaston um, Gabriel Marcel, um, who was to the swell what, um, what uh, William James was to Jung. Um, so he, um, Gabriel Marcel, uh, again from a correspondence, he had an adopted son and uh, the adopted son was married to Anne, who is still alive. And uh, Anne, from the correspondence which I had with her, I found that um, kind of they were uh, the witnesses, Robert Deswal and his wife Lucy were the witnesses of their marriage. So he was very close to Gabriel Marcel um, and his um, existentialist uh, perspective, which was influenced him, influenced him in the early years of his work. No, he was not. Um, but as I said, after he died, um, Pierre Janet um, influence um, is very much a source of influence both to Jung and also to this one. Um, but it's not the other way around. And he was also influenced by hypnosis, but he did not like the sense of control in hypnosis. So he he preferred the waking dream where the patient has more control. He didn't like the idea of kind of putting the patient in a trance and you know, 
and, uh, and this is more manipulative according to this one. Uh, of course, Charcot, which was, uh, uh, which Freud uh, knew very much, but he did not like, but again, the use of the couch uh, still has remnants of hypnosis, still has remnants also of like the psychoanalysis. And there is another group in France uh, which again integrates um, hypnosis again with uh, the waking dream of this one. So these, uh, I think the Reveveille, the directed waking dream, kind of can be integrated very easily with other schools of thought. But of course, um, the way it has to be done, it has to honor the principles that one attaches to it, otherwise it becomes um, just, um, you know, eclect an eclectic mix. Which, which jars with the main tenets. So Swan uh, gave a lecture in 1965 uh, where he refers to Dr. Jung several times. And Sorry? In speaking of Dr. Jung's uh, concept of the self, he accuses Dr. Jung of moving psychology uh, from psychology to metaphysics. And I am not hearing you. Um, um, let, let, let me repeat it for you. Can you hear me better, Leonard? Yes, yes. Okay. So um, in 1955, apparently, just swallowed. Uh, 1965. 65. A, 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 several months before his death. Okay. He gave a lecture in which he accuses Jung of moving away from psychology toward meta metaphysics in talking about the self. And do you have any? Well, he further said that uh, Dr. Jung's uh, concept of the self was inimical to scientific research. I think you are referring to the lecture of the Sorbonne, which is published in English. Uh, you know, I have a copy of the lecture, and that the, is the lecture of I do not know where it was given. Yes, where, where um, towards the end, because he died a year later, um, he was very much into behaviorism. But throughout his work, even in the last work, he still, even though, yes, criticizes to some extent Jung, as you say, but he keeps on referring to him. And while he had moved completely against psychoanalysis, um, but that was a that was a, a lecture that um, a small lecture, small presentation at the Sorbonne. Um, yes, he was very much in love with behaviorism, and he did. Um, again, you mentioned something about um, uh, the ontology of imagery. Um, which is different in Deswal and different in Jung, as um, the images of Deswal many times are, yes, they do. In the beginning, he speaks about the archetypal chain that images can, uh, for example, you see a monster and this monster changes and becomes your mother. So he translates the images to the personal um, aspects of one's life even though kind of the monster or the Medusa kind of these are archetypal images. While Jung, as I said in the beginning, the, the images are not only um, kind of, they, they have a wider meaning and, and they are not only related to the person, they are autonomous. And I think this is one of the main difference between Jung and the Swan, the autonomy of the images rather than the re reducing images to one's personal life. Uh, and he speaks about this, again, in a very beautiful way, almost in a fantastical way, that um, images also change and metamorphosize from one to the other, which classic Jungians were against. Although some Jungians said, why not allow images to change from one to the other? And they are still arising from the same complex. Um, but. Uh, again, allowing images to change from one to the other is more like free association. And classic Jungians didn't want to kind of sound like Freudians. 
So again, um, in a way, um, this wall was again trying to assert and kind of to link in a very lo in a very maybe faithful way his theories to to, to behavioristic. Um, but the idea of the transcendent, um, he still speaks about until the very end. This is the best way I can answer. Okay. Um, other, other questions? Are you finished with your slides, Lanner? I think, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, perhaps you could uh, un and share them then so that we can see you better and see the others better. Um, Skip, I have a question for Lana. Yeah, go ahead. Jeff Sangalang is a psychiatrist living in Hawaii. <laughs> Hi, Leonard. Hello. Aloha. <laughs> Anyway, um, I just have some little practical questions. Yes. As a uh, j j just a just a minute, Letter, can you uh, unshare your your screen up at up at the top? There should be a yeah. yeah that's perfect. Okay, terrific. <laughs> now we can see everybody. <laughs> Again, aloha, Leonard. Hello. I'm just just thoroughly enjoying your um, your. I'd say lecture here because um, this is very interesting to me and actually kind of new because um, going through medical school and psychiatry, we don't get a big dose of this. So, um, you know, this is uh, filling in a little bit of the gap here and uh, just have some little practical questions too. When you have a patient and uh, they say, oh, you know, I, I don't dream, I don't, you know, I don't remember my dreams. And what now you're, you're tr trying to get me to um, create dreams while I'm still awake. How do you deal with the resistance? And then also the second question is, you know, um, I totally agree with you about the imagery, the, the, the changes of the imagery and the autonomy of, um, you know, what you, what you see and, and imagine um, because it's open to a lot of interpretation. And of course we place the interpretation on the patient it's, um, it's their dream and their world. And so it's really important to, um, as a therapist to, you know, throw that back on them because oftentimes they want um, outside, um, I would say, you know, involvement and uh, be dependent on the therapist to um, tell them what their dream means. Uh, but I guess it's, it happens to everybody, you know, you're, you're anxious because you don't know what it really means and they don't want to have to struggle to um, work on it. So okay. please, Thank you for please advise. Very interesting. Um, the first one is, I think, um, I think therapy, psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, Jungian analysis or imaginative movement therapy, I think I see it as, um, as an art and, and kind of you need to, of course, the more you experience you have um, and as well, one needs to be taught, not only kind of listen to one's lecture presentation or to kind of, you know, start using these methods. And usually I teach these uh, uh, ways. And one of the most difficult things is what you say. And, um, I, I, I will give you an example of a patient which I see for a year now and um, uh, she, uh, I asked her after the first or second or third, do you have a dream? No, I don't dream. <laughs> Why should I? Dreams are nonsense. Okay. Oops. So blockage, no? So of course I am very cautious, very wary, but so I stay with what she presents for a while. And at one point, um, she speaks, she lives in the house of her parents. And, um, and uh, um, this is an old house and some of the rooms are closed. And um, I ask her kind of, kind of what is in these rooms? And she says, one are the things of my dead parents, parents, you know, and I don't, I close them. 
And then automatically she says, oh, you know, I had a dream. I saw my house and in one part of the house, which is uh, on my kitchen, but it's closed. Like in the past, there were pigeons in it. I saw a very wild dog, a very wild dog barking at us. She had a whole dream. So it was interesting just by speaking about, of course, she knew about it. She said no to me, which was important for her because she was having difficulties with her husband, who was very dominant. So, but it was, this came so naturally and so spontaneously. It was just by asking her, but it wasn't my intention. What if you opened this door? And then she remembered the dream. And we could work about, work with that primitive dog, the barking dog, which was like an abandoned dog, which is the abandoned part of herself which uh, caused her so much horror in the dream, which she never wanted to face. But uh, yes, um, another way which um, there are different methods. One of, for example, is um, with the one which uh, I mentioned about the bird earlier. Um, he, he plays video games. So we speak a lot about the fantasy and video games. They are a, a very good way of entering and continuing the dream. Or you can ask them what they like to watch, which TV series like to watch, and you can continue something. And um, yes, sometimes you have to wait. And, uh, and uh, I think we need to be, um, to stay with, with the, for the right time. Um, for the Greek speak about, of Kairos time, you know, the right moment when things can open. Um, and yes, there are, of course, there are techniques one can use. Um, but if there is resistance, we work with resistance. First of all, we have to see whether we're doing something which they are resisting us. And uh, again, you can ask them, you can change whatever you are experiencing. What if you are um, uh, trying to stop something from coming to you? A big boulder or trying to open something. You can also use that so that indirectly they can speak about the resistance which they are experiencing with you. Um, so this is what I can tell you. And yes, I agree in, in the dreams we don't, uh, we don't, uh, and waking dreams, um, we, don't in, we don't put meanings. Even this one did not uh, like that. Uh, we can amplify in a Jungian way you can ask for associations, but the most important thing is let the image speak to you. We witness it. It's like in a painting. You look at it and you still discover something new. And that is, Jung speaks about the effect of the image on the person. And that is what changes us. Um, so, so I think I forgot also to speak about lucid dreams. Um, there are, in a way, four types of oniric um, aspects. One is the most common, the nocturnal dream. Um, then there is the diurnal dream, which we call uh, a daydream, which is, which is different than a waking dream. Because in a daydream, I might be bored in a presentation and I might be thinking of going to the beach or something, my mind drifts somewhere else. While in a waking dream, like an active imagination, there is an intention to engage with something. It is not just, although daydreams and fantasies which come spontaneously, nowadays research um, shows that there is a, they are on one continuum. You can work with uh, the fantasies or daydreams as well, because you can still find complexes of the patient. And also sexual fantasies are also interesting. Nowadays with the pornographic addiction, um, I ask my patients what, what are the fantasies when they were young and during masturbation or um, uh, when they watch pornography. It, it is very interesting because 
you can understand a lot about the psyche of the person. Um, so there are many openings of how you can enter, but I think it is better to respect even though you feel, yes, sometimes you can ask them to draw maybe if they don't want to draw to talk about. If they don't have a dream, it's okay. And not, not these approaches are not for everyone. I think um, Jung said, uh, don't do the mistake. Thank God I am not a Jungian. <laughs> kind of, we have to find a theory for every patient. So it is difficult. It's more difficult for me. I don't know, and probably for you too, as a practitioner, when we find this resistance. But uh, yes, that example came to mind that in a way, kind of, um, it is um, again like uh, the best wine comes in the end when one can wait. And usually, in these cases, they can represent. And again, I, I can also say something else. Even though classic Jungians spoke about, um, spoke about that you don't present anything, uh, um, Jung speaks about two, two cases. One is the case of a patient where he couldn't uh, engage with active imaging. He couldn't do it. And at one point, he was in the train station and he saw a poster. And he went in the poster with his imagination. And he told Jung about it. Ironically, Jung chose the term active imagination for the first time in the Tapestock Lecture in 1935. But in, in, uh, he also before speaks about it as the, as, uh, as the picture method. And even Deswal um, speaks about this. Deswal also speaks about giving a, a stimulus not only with a word, but with a sound, with a tactile. So it's very similar to Jung. Jung speaks about different modalities. And, and uh, in, in I found one where he speaks of the um, picture um, uh, of, Bal, of, the, of the Viennese um, artist Baldung, which is uh, a picture of a skeleton, um, kind of, um, which is uh, behind a, a beautiful woman. And he would give the picture to start an imagination. And sometimes when I am in a different office, and I have a patient, and there are some pictures. And when you know when we stop sometimes in therapy, there is a silence, and they look. And their eyes fall on a picture, which is hanging, even though sometimes you know, we should have our, and again, idea of having a neutral space. But sometimes it falls on a picture. And you can engage them. What do you see? What strikes you? Ah, what if? You are there. What will happen? And this is a natural way. You don't need to um, present a Rorschach card, or because you can also start a TAT, you can also start a waking dream from a Rorschach card or a TAT, which interestingly as well were developed around the same time that Jung and Deswal were 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 developing their their methods. So projective techniques, again, like the village test the thematic of perception test which of uh, Henry Murray, who was the lover of Christina Morgan, which Jung speaks about in the vision seminars. And uh, um, Henry Murray then, uh, Christina Morgan did some of the drawings of the thematic of perception tests uh, to Henry Murray, which are not in the current pictures that we use, but. Um, originally, they were painted by Christiana Morgan, which Jung analyzed her paintings of her dreams. So, again, that is another way. Thank you very much. Yeah. Welcome. So, uh, other questions? A skip? Yeah, I'd, yes. I'd like to jump in on here. The, uh, thank you so much for uh, this this awesome lecture. Um, I'm trying to wrap my head around the, uh, my personal experience of this, um, 
the threshold between consciousness and unconsciousness. I can relate to it from uh, from my dream world, like a hypnagogic state, right before you're falling asleep. The, uh, to be at that threshold, to be conscious. I'm going to read one of your um, slides that uh, it'll it'll speak of what I'm trying to communicate here. And it's special training. In yoga and the West, Young stated that the method of active imagination consists in a special training for switching off consciousness, at least to a relative extent, thus giving the unconscious content a chance to develop. Now, the um, that's almost, or it is, to me, I'm hearing it's an autonomous other. That is, uh, could you elaborate on that more? You know, to, to, to shut off the consciousness, yet be conscious of the unconscious. Yes. yes. You know what yeah. As I said, it is not easy to do this thing. But when he speaks of shutting off consciousness, it doesn't mean that we kind of, um, you know, become unconscious and we fall or lose consciousness. Like we have a, a vasovagal attack. No, we have to remain aware. But I focus my attention on something. It could be on my breathing, it could be having less uh, distraction around it. So in this way, I limit distraction. I am still conscious, but in this way, I can listen more to what is going on in myself. It could be just being aware of my sensations in my body. And after taking time with doing this, then I can engage again with an image from my dream, which I, I recall, I stay with the dream. Okay, or I stay and, and meditate. Jung speaks of not interpretation, but a meditation. A meditation of an image, of a problem. And that is a way of getting in touch with an unconscious something which is still affecting you, but you don't know kind of what is happening. So... Again, it could be you wake up kind of disturbed in, with a dream. So something is knocking. The unconscious... Hey, let me, Sorry? Let me go a little fur further with this, with another slide. It's the purest approach to images, as you speak of. So using this method of uh, uh, meditating on the image, it says here in Mysterium, conjunction this young underline the importance of keeping the image as it is and not yes. to contaminate it with one's own ideas. Yes. Above all, don't let anything from outside that does not belong get into it. For the fantasy image has everything it needs. Yes. That's an autonomous other, is it not? That's letting it be itself, be yes. other than my conscious. Yes. So that's a, a life of its own. But not only that, not only that, he was saying don't contaminate the image. Don't um, kind of, if you have an image of a lion, okay, don't change that lion. Don't try to ask the patient to, as I said, as this while used to do, to give it something to the patient to scare away the dog. That is, you are contaminating the image. If the image is angry, stay with the angry image. Hillman speaks of staying with the image. Stick to the image. Again, this is very debatable. Jung and classic Jungians did not always um, do that. From my research and other people who researched this. I mentioned the case of Antonia Wolf when she was speaking with a patient and she was afraid of a figure called Leonard. And 
he was disturbing her at night and the day. And at one point, Antonia Wolf said something. She interfered and she told him, go away now. And the image, she said, bowed and left the room. So that is, again, this is Antonia Wolf, a classic Jungian, no? But, um, uh, but sometimes there was, again, it wasn't being done alone. And the image was, again, shout, in a way shouted at, it was, so again, in, in, in my work, I give a lot of examples of in 1977 in the conference, in the Congress of Analytical Psychology, there was a big debate. Um, um, the Cypriot analyst, uh, uh, Reno Papadopoulos, I think maybe some of you know him. He still remembered, I spoke to him, the debate between Von Franz and Ali Yombe, when she said, how can a lion change into a ship? And you allow the image to change? No, not like this one. He would encourage, and I would encourage sometimes patients to allow the image to change, to move. And, and von Franz was completely, completely um, against Elium Beck, who was also a Jungian analyst, and said, Elium Beck argued, it is from the same complex. So why not allow the image to change? So again, these debates can continue. And uh, I use the word purist in a way, this is my term, but or else uh, um, kind of a virginal image, you know, which is not touched by something which I put into it. Um, um, but yes, this is, this is uh, Again, from my research, I find that there are these contrasts and these, again, there are different perspectives. And as I said earlier, there are as well cultural perspectives. You cannot assume that every year working with someone from Italy as the same someone from Finland. Yes, we are the same human beings, but the, the culture, the extroversion, the, the Mediterranean qualities, um, we like to externalize uh, the symbolic with the uh, with feasts and uh, sanctuaries and images of the Virgin Mary, and it is di a different way of of living the symbolic. And I think these are, I think the truth is somewhere in between. And of course, you have to adapt, and you cannot just impose one with the other one or the other you know one has to be nowadays we work with um, people from different cultures you know and it's beautiful and uh, and um, and and we learn from them what what is their language what is their belief system how they do things and we need you know because i know this i have this method or tool i want to use it and i force it on someone maybe it doesn't speak to them um, uh, could, it, could it be uh, images where what I'm tapping into here? Uh, could it be images arising from a personal conscious or unconscious state as opposed to the collective unconscious? Can the collective unconscious have more autonomy than my personal image? I, I get what you're saying about letting the image be pure, that's beautiful. But that autonomous nature is where I'm trying to uh, grasp. As I said in the beginning, many times, of course, if you're working with dreams, you can, of course, there are a lot of um, um, images, archetypal images, no? Um, when you're doing waking dreams, this needs time. And usually the first images that arise are images from the personal unconscious. And then over time, they can tap into a deeper realm. Um, so it, it, it needs time. Um, first of all, to kind of to get used to the um, accessing the unconscious and also how to access 
and how these autonomous images emerge. Uh, I think in my experience, you know, it needs time. Yeah. And, um, and yes, with dreams too. I think um, many times our dreams are made of our people, friends, family, relatives, uh, colleagues. But then sometimes I dream of, I don't know, the Virgin Mary or, or, or uh, Skip mentioned Caesar <laughs> in the beginning. Mm -hmm. These are moments when the image comes up, which is more archetypal, no? Mm -hmm. um, but again, uh, in the process, or sometimes you have um, an Im imagery of animals. Again, so there are different levels um, of archetypal imagery as well, which of course, in analysis, we can also gives us an insight about where the person is. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Go go ahead. I want to ask on the story about Leonard and being fearful of Leonard affected uh, the imagery. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think that that episode occurred with Tina Keller and not with Tony Wolf. Wasn't Leonard the anima, animus figure of Tina Keller? That yeah, that's what I thought. Mars? That's yeah, what it I could thought. be, I, I, I mix them up. It could be I mix them up. There's so much information. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Miles, you had a question. The book and, is over 200 I, pages of footnotes and, and yeah. I remember everything, yeah. Thank you. Uh, hello, Dr. Kassar. Um, my name's Miles, and I'm in Canada. And five years ago, uh, I thought, okay, I, I want to find a new job. And I really related to what you said about a person doesn't always find the work, the work finds you. And five years ago, I started on this quest as to, all right, what, do I, what am I going to do in this home stretch now that I'm 60, um, with, that it's going to have meaning and purpose. And so um, working on uh, issues where I live here in Canada, and two and a half years ago, I encountered Skip. In fact, I know exactly the day I first encountered him, it was December 11th, 2017, on a channel with a pastor um, and what I'm interested in is um, this work that I'm involved in is related to the collective and the existential. And you did have a slide that uh, re suggested that what uh, most of what you've been talking about could have, uh, it's not just for individual healing, but it could be for collective healing. So in Canada, I'm very much drawn into what's called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission work with First Nations. Although this typical Canadian would, if you asked how old is Canada, they would say about 153 years. Uh, well, it's actually, if you ask the people on the West Coast, the Indigenous people, they would say, no, we've been here for 30,000 years. So anyway, is there a word to describe um, the work that Skip and I are w involved in together, we, we and everybody, in a sense, is part of my filiation map, shall we say, as you presented on, on what I'm working on. Is there a word that you would use um, to describe the collective or existential application of what you've talked about today? Okay, it's a difficult uh, way want to answer, but I, I can maybe share some associations of hearing you. First of all, well done for the work that you are doing. It's, uh, I think, uh, a very soulful work trying to connect and to share and to do something together. You know? um, again, we're living troubled times and I think we need um, to support each other and we kind of, um, you know, to reflect together, to contain something which is almost uncontainable. Um, again, Jung's work was also um, focused on the individual. 
and um, his, his method, even of active imagination, was a solitary activity because he believed that if a person, in a way, improves himself, kind of, and when, in, as therapist, we help someone to, to kind of get in touch with himself, work with the shadow material, we are helping society in the long run. We are changing society. Although, of course, it is a, maybe with a, um, there's a, quite a gap to arrive there. But in a way, there's something one can do. Um, so, um, again, I think the work kind of trying to uh, use the Nesuan's work to active imagination and bringing active imagination into a relational space and into a communal space because waking dreams can also be done in groups. And Jungians nowadays we have, we have um, dreaming in groups. Um, kind of when kind of one does not interpret a dream individually, but but the dream is of the of the group. Like for example, certain cultures used. Um, so I think that is also something communal. And also waking dreams can be done in groups. Um, there was an Italian, there was a disciple of Tessois, his name was Leopold, Leopold Dorico. His school is still in Italy. Um, uh, and they would form a star lying down and one would start a dream and the other one would continue the dream. So again, there were several attempts at using dreams for the community, for the collective. Uh, social dreaming in the Jungian world is something like this, you know. Um, so, I don't know, the word communal, something which is, is, is in between us, um, that we create this space, shared space, where we allow, again, the unconscious to speak to us, and uh, images can come up in many forms, no? Um, so, kind of these are my reflections. You, um, Deswal as well was interested in groups, especially when he was in his younger ages. He also was a, a member of the Oxford Movement, uh, which is a kind of a, um, a Catholic group, um, again, in order to, to support um, to support people um, with their lives. Um, he was a, he, he, he together with another uh, priest called Per Amable and two other Swiss doctors would, would um, form part of the Oxford movement of Frank Bachman from my research. So he was very much interested in the collective. And yeah. also, as I said, um, he, he also took part in wars. He supported his brothers with the, um, with the, the French Accords of the 1928, the Matignon Accords, where kind of a lot of workers got their rights. So, so they were quite activists, even though his method is very introverted and very, very kind of focused on interiority. There is another part which I did not speak about today, which is my favorite chapter as well, where I kind of speak about, because this one and also Jung speaks about Ignatius of Loyola and the, uh, the um, several people who, were, who had visions of Christ, of the Virgin Mary, and they were also forms of waking dream. Um, so how the, level, how the notion of interiority also emerged, where, where instead of focusing on the mind, people started focusing on the heart. Hence, the images of the heart of Jesus the heart of Mary, where the emphasis was on the heart and the emotion. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, again, they would go to the confessor, the male confessor, and they would speak about their visions. So they were in a, in a way speaking, connecting the visual with the vocal, and they would write it. So there's a strong connection between between um, 
the Confessions again of Saint Augustine is, is, is one of the first books on theology. And uh, then of course there are other books, but which was very popular in France of the 18th century. And uh, again, and devotional literature is full of these anecdotes of these famous saints that we were exposed to as children, no? who would see the heart pierced or many other images. Again, they were um, images from, we can say, from the unconscious, no? Yeah. And, so, uh... So, Leonard, I, uh, I really appreciate your uh, staying so long. I know this is getting to be a long session uh, for you. Um, I, if, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to just speak for a minute about some personal experiences of mine. You can comment or not comment as you wish, um, but also about what the genesis of, of what I'm doing is, okay, not only these meetings, which I started with Tim back in April, but um, my long work, which goes back into the, um, well, my, my work on Jung started in 1987, <laughs> so <laughs> quite a while back. But um, first of all, one of the things that I I, I do think that Jung was interested in the collective also, but he, he was very seriously um, encapsulated in Switzerland between the two world wars. And, and so I think he was limited about how active he could have been in those times. But it has always struck me that... Um, somehow we need to get some of these ideas out to more people than just the an analysis of Jungian analysts and, uh, and much faster because while I acknowledge that, you know, if you fix somebody, uh, that person isn't gonna be a problem for society anymore. Meanwhile, we have, you know, several million people being born every day. And, and so how, how do we, properly educate society so that they can face their questions. That, you know, that's sort of um, the genesis of what I'm doing. Um, but one of my experiences, which was six years into my studies, was that I, um, I wrote a novel and I was pushed to write this novel. Uh, and it was, in fact, an act of imagination. I mean, I have no physical recollection of writing it other than the fact that an entity woke me up every morning at 6 a.m. and caused me to go to my computer. I intentionally kept the lights dim and I put the, the screen on my computer dim so that I, it wouldn't wake me up and I would just let it flow. And so I never have any recollection of, of my fingers touching the keyboard, for example, during that period of time. Um, and it just flowed through me. Um, it, was, it was a possession that lasted for eight months. And at the end of it, I had a novel and I had told a story. And um, that happened in 1993, so it wasn't until the Red Book came out in 2009 that I really knew that, okay, if that could happen to the greatest psychiatrist of the 20th century, then maybe I'm okay too, right? But it occurred to me uh, that that process is essentially what happens to, or has happened to some of the great novelists of history that they have connected in that in that way and then their story just comes from the unconscious people like Tolstoy or Dostoevsky or um, you know many others um, and that when they when they're unable to do that or they're unable to see that what they want is to be able to basically have an active imagination. And so, uh, you 
you know, the history of the 20th century is just filled with novelists who've killed themselves with either drugs or alcohol. Uh, and my interpretation of that, that writer's block is that they're unable to put themselves back into that state that I'm talking about that I was in. And, and as I said, that state continued in me. I mean, I went on with my life, but every day from six in the morning till nine in the morning, I had to write 500 or a thousand words every day. And I, I say this is the, an autobiography of my anima. So my anima forced me to write this thing down and it, it didn't stop until it was done. I mean, I think of it as a, as an archetype that, you know, once it gets going, it plays through to the end. And uh, so I wonder if you have a comment on that, and then I'll tell you also about another incident. Do you, do you have a comment about the, this creative idea yeah. that active imagination bring, can bring forth a novel or great paintings also or other usually the things. analytic process itself analysis itself can unleash creative potential no? um, so i think it is also one of the aims of analysis you know, and that brings out the potential of every individual which then can come out and then Jung speaks and says active imagination is about the transformation of personality. Um, so this is the first thing that comes to mind. Then, as well, you mentioned artists, novelists, who also speak to these big people who, you know, they have different voices, different, you know, you know they say when they're writing, it's not them they're writing. Sometimes the character is a different part which takes control and comes to life, you know. Um, the difference between, to me, is this is, is okay and it's fascinating in itself, you know, and it happens. But it is not enough unless I look at it from the ego position. You know, the great works of art for example, usually the artist will is a medium, is a, is a is a midwife of something of the collective unconscious. You know, when an image, kind of the artist dreams of an image, or an image comes to him through the art and communicates something to the to society, because he is in touch with something from the collective unconscious. But again, this might not. It might just um, be unnoticed, you know, unless the person the person engages with it and see and have an ethical confrontation. So, out of this novel, out of this art, what is for me? What is there for me? Otherwise, kind of, it can be a beautiful um, um, literary experience, a beautiful experience, a fascinating, a numinous speaks of luminosity, but not for its own sake, in the sense that kind of otherwise there is kind of there is the risk that I, I, I you know, I, I need to, to, to sit with it and see what it means for me. Otherwise, it, it can be a beautiful literary piece of work, a genius, um, even what's his name? Um, the Irish um, writer. Oh, James yeah. Joyce, or James Joyce, yes. Yeah. Kind of key. <laughs> when Jung saw his writing, I don't could not understand what happened or the works of um, the modern artists, you know. Um, again, so these are my thoughts. But yes, I do agree with you. When when one taps into the numinous, it is a, a um, kind of, in a way, it is a kind of a seismic shift inside the person. You know? mm -hmm. It's like again when seeing, when we read of these visions of these great saints, you know, which left such an impact, and because of that, then they do such great things. 
they change you know, St. Francis or, or St. Paul or whatever, you know, they change. They, they, did, they experience when you experience the numinous, you know, something changes. Yeah, it, do, it doesn't mean necessarily that they're going to be a novelist because I didn't write another novel after that one. <laughs> However, I've, I've done lots of other different creative things since then. Um, and so just, uh, I, I, if you don't mind, I'll just give you an example of a, of a dream that turned into a waking dream, uh, just as an example for you. Um, so I had, I had this dream that I was, uh, a, um, a journalist and I was in a southern U.S. town and the idea was to sneak into a Ku Klux Klan meeting and um, take photographs of the Klansmen. And um, I don't know exactly how it happened, but somehow I ended up in jail. And um, the, the sheriff was there sitting in a desk and it turned out he had long white hair and a big white beard but anyway he was the sheriff <laughs> and and uh so he he uh came in and took me out of the jail and uh i told him what i was doing there and he just sort of laughed and then that was the end of the dream and so I said, wow, that's an interesting dream. I'd really like to know what that was about. And so uh, about two hours later, I just sat quietly and just tried to put myself back into that environment with the sheriff and the, and the sheriff's office. And so the sheriff then walks out on the porch of his, of his sort of an old west type of sheriff's office, right? And out in front of his office is a throng of Ku Klux Klansmen, just a sea of, of these people in white sheets, right? And when he comes out the door, or when we come out the door, but he goes first, uh, the Klansmen just separate. And uh, and in the in the distance, and it was like, the Red Sea was parting, except it was white, right? And in the distance on the horizon was the sunrise, but the sun was eclipsed, okay? And then as we watched, the eclipse was moving aside. And the next thing I knew, I was in this uh, meadow just a beautiful meadow, a wonderful day, and the sheriff and all that stuff was gone and, and so on. And uh, just a long story short now, um, that, that dream came uh, at the beginning of the current U.S. administration. <laughs> and obviously many people were worried about what was going to happen. And I just found that at tremendously encouraging dream and active imagination. But the part from the time we went out on the porch through the rest of it all came while I was awake. I was having this dream in a waking state. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I've called that a, an act of imagination, sort of an act of imagination continuing on a dream. but. Maybe you call that a waking dream, I'm not sure. Yeah, yes. I think they are different terms, no? But then speaking of how you can develop it, then it's, again, there are some minor differences, no? Yeah. You can speak to the sheriff and continue active imagination. Yeah. Okay, and, and uh, see what happens. Or... If you are doing the Desualian directed waking dream or IMT, kind of we can see where we go, what happens. Mm -hmm. if we, when we go through, what do you experience inside of oneself? What is the main emotion? I think that's important. Right. And so there is, this is a strong authority figure in experience. So they are polar, pol these polarities of authority and rebellion. Right, right, right. Uh, and, uh, an eclipse, you know, there's, there's again, 
Um, yeah. Again, you mentioned Moses and, and <laughs> from exile, you know. Right, right. Going towards um, Jerusalem, you know. Yeah. So in, in case of you know, moving towards the sun, this. this yeah. Um, well, I, I I always take dreams as messages, dreams and visions as messages from the unconscious, yeah. and so I I took that as uh, you know a, a time of angst, but uh, a very encouraging message from my unconscious about what the future uh, could be, yeah. and uh, that's at least that's how I reflected on it and thought about it. Anyway. And usually some images keep repeating. Uh -huh. You might have another dream. Uh -huh. Well, I, I haven't had another one like that particularly, but <laughs> I have lots of dreams. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that was a kind of a, a dream which left an impact on you. So yes, um, yes yeah. when, when these things happen. You, you mentioned the ego um, in terms of going into the uh, act of imagination. And um, that particular incident was the first time I'd gone into act of imagination since 1993. So a time of about 14 years intervened. And I was always very reluctant to go into act of imagination, even though I have a fairly established ego probably uh, so um i wonder if you have any advice for young people i mean um 90 percent of the audience of this youtube channel is young people between 18 and 44 mainly men nine 90 percent are young men in that age and so i wonder if you have any uh general rules that you would suggest in terms of making sure your ego is is established before you try to play around with these things in the unconscious i think there's a lot of interest in, in for the um, transcendent you no know, in young people and mm -hmm. especially since there are no kind of society collectively we're not supporting the youths to find meaning in their life. There are very little rituals right. to help um, these young people to find meaning. Um, you know, youths are trying to find them on their own with um, um, taking drugs, for example, with um, online gaming, you know, kind of they go into uh, an, alter, an alternative world. Uh, a different word they want to access something different but that is risky um, and many times as well even waking dreams the shamans for example would take peyote for example or the um, or other kind of um, substances in order kind of to go into an alternative state of consciousness an altered state of consciousness and this was also the research, which interestingly, Jung was very much against. He only speaks of some wine in, in one of his letters, but he's against drugs. While Desoy was interested in research with the peyote in the 19th, I think, 1933, I can't remember the date exactly. He wrote an article on the use of peyote. Mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 and he also, um, he also kind of um, sometimes used it. And some of his disciples, for example, the Uruguayan Mario Berta, um, who also went to speak to Marie bon, Louise von France, the Indian, um, they developed what is called um, um, psycholytic therapy, where they would take um, LSD. Mm -hmm. And they did a lot of experiments. However, um, I have one colleague of mine in France, Philippe Grosbois, also tried something similar and experience of, of this. He is also with a, uh, a disciple of one of his, of uh, a friend of this one, uh, Virel. Um, and they said that, you know, 
when you take these grants, the, the imagination goes haywire. There is very little sense. Yeah. Um, okay. So it's 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 kind of again, it's not maybe the best way. To, right. Um, that that's my observation. I mean, I I know that at Johns Hopkins they're doing some experiments with yeah. with yeah. LSD. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, it was popular in the 60s and 70s. Even Hans Karl Leuner used, used it. Stanislav Graf changed it into breathing when it became legal in the United mm -hmm. States um, and used breath work instead. Yeah, um, because we had. In Nesta then near California, you know. But yeah. now there's a return of research for drug addiction, interestingly, as well, using yeah, sure. some of this. But, yeah, we, we lost 72,000 people to drugs a couple of years back. And I, I think the problem is still there. So um, we have to rethink those ideas unless we're under a strict supervision. <laughs> and there are other ways how, how, how the connection with the, you know, with the irrational kind, kind of can come up. I don't know, for example, you know, a lot of young people I meet when I work with young people bring in Harry Potter or whatever the series is they're watching or online games they're playing. And you can use that to access something deeper in them. Um, so again, they're hungry and, and you know, it's these, these things kind of fascinate them and speak to them. So even though we live in a very maybe shallow where there is very, very little emphasis on, on the spiritual in a wider sense, you know? Right. Kind of, it comes in in some other ways. And, yeah. But again, I think, um, and a lot of young people search for things and they look for help and guidance, um, given that we have failed them with very little rituals in our society. So the rituals are, even with COVID-19, a lot of, rituals of ending school and celebrating together yeah. you know, have, couldn't have been very, very little direction is my observation too the because rituals that there has been have been taken away you know mm -hmm. they couldn't celebrate i don't know how the communion or um, prom or you know yeah it was it made it more difficult for them um so i think it's very very challenging for me to be a teenager in our times. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, my friend Maxie here is uh, giving us a quote. He said uh, the, there was a question and answer that involved uh, Jung. And the question was, do you occasionally resort to stimulants of any kind, alcohol, morphine, hashish, hashish et cetera? Answer, oh no, I never, uh, uh, oh no, never. A new idea is intoxicating enough. And that's mm -hmm. from Collected Works, 18, page 787. As I said, he mentions wine sometimes. You know. um, to, to, I forgot to whom the letter was sent, but he mentioned that some wine occasionally can help a person. You know, to, to, but he is against drugs, definitely. Yeah. And for you, yeah. it's important. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me um, sort of wrap this up by saying that we've been uh, talking to uh, Dr. Leonard Kasser from Malta, and uh, I'm going to share on the screen your book cover because we've been talking about your book. And um, so this is the book, Dr. Uh, Kasser's new book, uh, which will be uh, available in one week, and it's available for pre-order uh, now. And uh, I must say, Leonard, that you've certainly made it seem quite interesting to me, and I'm, I'm uh, very, in, very attracted to um, re see what you've been talking about. So I thank you very much for spending all this time with me near with us nearly three hours and uh, this will become a, a permanent playback on the YouTube channel and uh, the YouTube channel is Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group for those of you who don't know 
um, I have to I have to get better about uh, putting that up there. But in, in any case, um, just uh, for future reference, we have a, a number of very exciting sessions coming up. There's nothing officially scheduled yet for this coming weekend. Next Tuesday at 1 p.m., we have uh, Dr. John Jackson talking about uh, the women of the Old Testament. Uh, and Dr. Jackson is a 40-year uh, now retired Jungian psychiatrist from uh, California. Um, and then uh, a week from Sunday, we have Ann Belford Ulanoff, and she's going to speak a bit to us about blundering into redemption. And of course, all of us need redemption. <laughs> and, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> and Dr. Ulanoff is, uh, is very well known. Uh, she's a emeritus professor of psychiatry and religion at Union Theological Seminary. And uh, she's written at least 17 books on her own, maybe more, and uh, six with her husband. So uh, she's very well known in the Jungian community. And I hope everyone will uh, come and hear that. That's on July the 26th, 2020 at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, on August the 8th, we have a, another session at 10 p.m. Uh, U.S. Eastern time, which is again with Melissa Townsend about the Tarot, uh, which is an area that I'm now exploring a little further uh, again. And on the 9th of August, uh, we have Mary Stein, who is the co-author of Young's Red Book for Our Time, or co-editor of it with Thomas Arst. And uh, Murray is going to talk with us about Thomas and also um, talk about his, his own essay, which is in volume three uh, of the series uh, about the Aurea Catania, which I don't think most people are very familiar with. Um, and on the 18th of August, we have uh, Dr. Ann Lee who's now in Zurich, and she's going to talk uh, to us about uh, Taoist uh, theory. So anyway, thank you so much for being with us today. All right, is there anything else that you would like to add here at the end? Thank you, Skip, for the generous invitation to be on your platform. And thank you to all the participants who patiently stay and listen to what I have to say about my book. I hope you decide to have a look at it, that you will continue to enjoy it. Thank you. I, ho I hope, hope to see you in person next, yes. next year at Eternos, but if not, maybe the year after. <laughs> if Americans are ever allowed back in Europe. <laughs> yes, true, true. Yeah. Thank you very much again, everyone. And, uh, okay. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.